This has been a Hampton County story. This has been a Hampton County scandal. A jury found the disgraced South Carolina attorney guilty of murdering his wife and his youngest son. This has been the downfall of a family dynasty. Today is not the end. It's the next step in a long road to justice for every person who has been victimized by Alex Murdoch. Justice for Stephen Smith, Alex. Stephen Smith was another body in this orbit of the Murdoch family. Stephen was a gay young man in the low country of South Carolina. That is courageous in and of itself. I can't imagine the terror he was in that night. In the early morning hours of July 8, 2015, 19-year-old Stephen Smith was found dead in the middle of a rural road. There was an autopsy that basically said it's a hit and run. There was no vehicle debris, no broken headlight, paint scrapes or, or anything. You never believed it? No, not at all. He never would have been walking in that road, not voluntarily. Do you believe Stephen was murdered? I do. An investigation of some sort took place that led nowhere. And then it went cold. I wanted a second opinion. Sandy Smith is unique in this whole story. She doesn't know who killed her son. She doesn't know why. People in town really believed that it was connected to the Murdochs in some way. The name Buster Murdoch kept coming up. I never had anything to do with his murder, and I never had anything to do with him on a physical level of, of any regard. The rumors also suggest uh, a cover-up. We are aware of no evidence today that would suggest that any Murdoch played any role in Stephen Smith's death or played any role in trying to cover up the investigation into his death. All I want is peace and knowing what happened to my son. He's my world, and I'm gonna fight to the end. This is a woman that has fought this battle alone since 2015, screaming as loud as she could with not a lot of people listening. CBS News confirming that the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division is now investigating Stephen Smith's death as a homicide. The Murdoch case brought Stephen's cold case to life. Somehow, some way in the Murdoch murder investigation, a new thread was opened up into Stephen Smith. Our primary function right now is to have that body exhumed, have a true independent set of eyes look at it, and tell us once and for all what really happened to Stephen Smith. The gash was from part of this eyebrow across here. The injuries can tell us so much about what happened. And in this case, they did. They did. Set the scene for me on July 8th, 2015, here. Stephen was somewhat right here in the road. How confident are you that you know what happened to Stephen Smith that night? I'm as close to a degree of scientific certainty as I've ever felt. Like his mother, Sandy, Stephen Smith was born a fighter. He was a preemie. He weighed two pounds, 12 ounces. A twin. Yeah, a twin. Born at 27 weeks with his sister, Stephanie, Sandy says Stephen couldn't breathe on his own. After several months, she was told he might not make it. And she was finally allowed to hold her baby for the first time. How was that moment? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. It was supposed to be my goodbye. <laughs> but he started breathing on his own. Because he felt you? Yeah, that's why he was my heart. Sandy never dreamed she'd one day be fighting for answers in her son's death. How would you describe the journey that you've been on for justice? It's been a hard journey, just living day by day and 
fighting day by day. On July 8th, 2015, Stephen was found dead on a country road in Hampton County, the same county where three generations of Murdoch men had held the top prosecutor job for nearly a century. The Murdoch still loomed large over small town life. Alec Murdoch coached Stephen's baseball team at one point. When they were little, well, I think Stephen was like seven or eight. Stephen and Stephanie were also classmates of Murdahl's older son, Buster, before Stephen went to nursing school with dreams of one day becoming a doctor. He wanted to be a doctor, but it was more expensive, so he just started with nursing school. He loved dealing with medicine, and I mean, he just loved it. You must have been so proud. Oh, I was. But instead, Sandy says those dreams were buried with her son. You decided to bury him in his scrubs? Scrubs. Dr. Stephen Smith, he had everything he needed in his pocket. He had a stethoscope and everything he needed. Stephen had just completed a semester of school and was taking summer classes, shuttling back and forth between his parents, who lived apart. He had visited Sandy a week before he was killed. A storm started brewing. I told him that he needed to hurry up and get back to his dad's house. So when he made it, he texts me and says, I made it safe, Mom. Mama, I love you. Sandy says those were Stephen's last words to her. Days later, she would hear the news that would alter the course of her life. July 8th, I was on my way to work, and I was listening to a local radio station, and I heard that they had found a body. Sandy called her daughter Stephanie right away. She said, Mama, did Stephen stay with you last night? Because he didn't come home last night. And then my stomach dropped and I knew it was him. Sandy says Stephen's father, Joel, went to the sheriff's office for confirmation that it was Stephen. That's when she says they received a call. Well, I was on the phone with Joel the whole time while we were waiting for the sheriff to come out. And that's when Joel asked me to hold on because Randy Murdoch was calling. Randy Murdoch is Alec Murdoch's older brother and had been representing Joel Smith in a workers comp case. But now he was calling about Stephen. When Joel got back on the phone, he said Randy had asked if that was our Stephen and that he wanted to help pro bono. Did you think it was strange that Randy offered to help pro bono? Well, I did, but Joel thought it was a Nice gesture. Later that morning, Sandy says she was surprised again as she drove past the scene where Stephen's body had reportedly been found. There was Alex and Randy standing on the opposite side of the road. Murdoch. Murdoch. A few minutes later, Sandy says Randy Murdoch called again. And asked if that was me that passed by. He said, I wish you to stop so I could have met you. Randy Murdoch declined our request for an interview. But through his attorney, he provided a written statement to 48 hours in which he said, quote, I was not aware of Stephen's death until Joel told me they wanted my involvement and I contacted law enforcement on their behalf. Murdahl said he went to the scene with a private investigator after meeting with Joel and Stephanie, adding, quote, claims that I visited the scene of Stephen's death with my brother Alec are false. Joel Smith passed away three months after Stephen. But Stephanie and Sandy told us they never asked the Murdals for help. And there were other things about Stephen's case that didn't sit well with Sandy from the moment the sheriff confirmed the body was Stephen's. At first, he told them Stephen had been shot. What were you thinking? Who would shoot him? It made no sense. I lost it then. I left my job and just drove back to Hampton, and we just mourned together. We just couldn't understand why or who. It was just the biggest shock of our life. Within hours, Stephen's cause of death was suddenly changed to a hit and run. Toward the evening time, we were contacted by the sheriff's office. And after his autopsy, there was not any type of bullet or bullet fragment found in his head. Because his body was in the roadway, it was being ruled a hit and run. Retired South Carolina Highway Patrol Lieutenant Thomas Moore was the on-scene supervisor. I was told that the medical examiner made that ruling, and I reached out to her. It became a little bit heated. Give me an answer medically that would lead you to believe he was hit by a car. There was no medical reason. Did you see any signs of a hit and run? No, ma'am, none. Any type of debris, any kind of 
glass, car parts, piece of plastic, anything that looks like it may be related to a vehicle. Also unusual for a hit and run, Stephen's clothing was intact and his shoes, which were loosely tied, were still on. Generally clothes are torn or unraveled and shoes have come off. And Stephen's car keys and cell phone were in his front pocket unharmed. And Moore says Stephen's body appeared staged. His body was laying like it had been placed in a certain position, not what you would typically see. And it looked like somebody had hit him in the head with some kind of object. Meanwhile, Stephen's wallet was still in his car, which investigators found three miles away, with the doors locked and the gas cap hanging open. In all the years I've worked, a car sitting on the side of the road with a gas cap off is not normal. I thought it was staged like his body was staged in the roadway. Sandy says she wondered if Stephen might have been the victim of a hate crime. Did you think that it was possibly because of his sexuality? I did think that. I know he was teased a lot at school, but he still held his head high. But Sandy says in the days leading up to his death, Stephen was worried about his safety. He'd called his sister Stephanie for help the day before he was killed. Stephanie said the battery cable was loosened on his car. So she had met him and then she tightened the battery cable. And she asked him to get out of the car and help her. And he said, no, I'm not getting out. Like he was scared. Right. But he never said why. Despite what Lieutenant Moore felt were suspicious circumstances, he says once Stephen's death was ruled a hit and run, it became the Highway Patrol's job to solve the case instead of the Hampton County Sheriff's Office or SLED, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. I felt like the case, for lack of a better word, was being pawned off on us. No matter what we said, we were going to be the ones investigating that case. As we were getting started, certain names started coming up. Which names? Murdoch. Soon after Stephen Smith was killed, Hampton County Guardian Managing Editor Michael DeWitt says he began hearing persistent rumors all over town. What are the rumors? That at least one Murdoch child was in a vehicle with other boys and allegedly Somebody in the vehicle struck the young man with the baseball bat and killed him. Sandy says those same rumors hit her doorstep as soon as Stephen's body was taken for an autopsy. It made no sense to me. At any point, did you think that someone in the Murdoch family was involved? Well, the longer it went on, the more I was asking myself questions. But I just couldn't find the connection powerful family and then you got Stephen who was just Stephen. Sandy couldn't help but think back to her last conversation with Stephen a week before he was killed. Somebody was messaging him a lot. He told me that he was going deep sea fishing and he said Key West and I said well who are you going with? He said well I can't tell you. Did that make you pause? Yeah. He said you'd be surprised. It's kind of like a prominent person. And then all I could say was, well, I hope you have fun. Sandy says Stephen had become more secretive the last couple weeks, but it never crossed her mind he might be talking about a Murdoch. The original rumor was that Stephen was planning to go away with Buster Murdoch and his family, that they were together romantically. Liz Farrell is the writer and co-host of the Murdoch Murders podcast. There's no evidence of that that we know of. And 48 Hours found no evidence to support the rumors. Retired Highway Patrol Lieutenant Thomas Moore says the mere mention of the Murdals made it difficult to get help from local agencies. We tried to hand that case file over to the sheriff's office and they physically would not take it from our hand. The Murdoch name was still very powerful, very well connected in law enforcement. And the rumor suggested, well, the local cops aren't going to dig into it. Instead, the case was handled solely by the Highway Patrol's multidisciplinary accident investigation team called MATE, which specializes in complex vehicle crashes. The MATE team was from out of town, and we wanted outside eyes involved in this. The Murdoch name appears dozens of times in MATE's 2015 case file, which we obtained through a Freedom of Information request. In his audio notes, Corporal Michael Duncan makes it clear he doesn't think Stephen's death is a hit and run. 
There is no body trauma other than to the head area. It does not appear to be, in my opinion, struck by a vehicle. Another investigator, Todd Proctor, goes further. Typically, you don't see the highway patrol working a murder, and that's what this is. He hints at a conflict of interest for the local sheriff's department. There's a reason why Hampton County Sheriff's Department is not handling this, and I'll leave it at that. In this interview with Proctor, local teen Taylor Dobson shares a detailed version of that story about several young men in a truck. I heard that these two, maybe three young men were in a vehicle. They were riding down 601, saw the car on the side of the road. I guess saw the boy walking. Um, they turned back around and stuck something out the window. He offers a name reluctantly. He goes by Buster Murdoch. Dobson says he grew up with Buster kind of out of character to who I knew. It was just strictly hearsay from all I know. Proctor reassures him the Murdals are already aware authorities want to speak with Buster. They know that he's on our radar. Matter of fact, I talked to one of their guys yesterday and, and told them, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk to Buster here soon. You know, and they said, okay, that's fine. But according to the case file, a call to Buster Murdall in October 2015 was never returned. And in December, following a front page story in the Hampton County Guardian, Mate received a tip called in at the direction of Randy Murdall, Buster's uncle. A man named Daryl Williams called a Hampton police officer to report the tip, which involved two teens, Sean Connolly and Patrick Wilson. In a recorded phone call, the officer relays to Corporal Duncan what Williams told him. Daryl called me and he said, Patrick, come over here to the house. He said he that Sean Connolly was drunk and hit something. He went back the next day to see what it was he had hit and he seen a lot of police out there. Patrick was crying, telling him, and after he got finished telling the story, he walked outside his house and threw up. Did he go into any detail about how it happened? Uh, supposedly, he had fixed his mirror, one of the mirrors up on the truck. The side mirror story matched Stephen's original death certificate. For reasons that are unclear, there is no record of Duncan or Proctor ever speaking to Connolly or Wilson. Wilson had no comment to 48 hours. Messages to the Hampton County Sheriff's Office, Williams and Connolly have not been answered. Sandy Smith says she asked Sean Connolly point blank if he killed Stephen. And he said? He said, no, ma'am, I did not. I give you my word, I promise you, I never killed your son. Do you believe him? Yeah. If he lied to you, if that turns out to be the case. It won't be the first time I'm lied to, but you know, if you did it, you need to pay. In September 2016, fed up with what she calls the lack of an investigation, Sandy began a letter writing campaign that included the FBI. What did your letter say? I was just letting them know that my son was murdered and there's no progress being done. And I think it had something to do with the Murdoch family. And please help, just please help me. Sandy also told the FBI she believed someone was deliberately trying to derail the investigation. Did you ever get a response from the FBI? I did, and I had two agents come to my house. She asked them to unlock Stephen's phone, and they did. Do you know if anyone actually was able to read Stephen's text messages or see where he might have been based on cell phone evidence? What I heard from the FBI agent, there was a, a lot of interesting information in the phone that needed to be looked at. But she says that didn't prompt a local or state authorities to pursue the case further. There's something in that phone that nobody wants out there. By late 2016, the investigation into Stephen Smith's death went cold. What do you think it took for Stephen's case to finally get the attention it deserves that you wanted? Somebody else had to die. What information do you think was found on Stephen's phone? Chat now with the 48 Hours team on Facebook and X. The murders of Paul and Maggie Murdahl in June of 2021 caused a seismic shift in small town Hampton and gave Sandy Smith a lifeline she desperately needed. It took 
this to get Stephen's name back out there so somebody would start paying attention. In a strange twist of fate, while investigating the murders of Paula Maggie Murdahl, SLED announced it had stumbled on a new lead in Stephen's death and would be taking over the case. They did not say what that evidence was. It seems like all roads lead to the Murdahl family around here. Yes. Is that coincidence or is there a reason for that? Around here, it's natural. It would be another two years while authorities focused on getting a conviction against Alec Murdahl, but Sandy now has a high octane legal team in her corner. After eight years of waiting for your turn, Sandy Smith finally just had enough. Ronnie and I are like arsonists. We started the fire. Ronnie Richter and Eric Bland are representing Sandy pro bono. Our sole goal was to rekindle the interest in Stephen's death. And they turned up the heat on SLED. In March of 2023, SLED publicly acknowledged it was treating Stephen's case as a homicide. The same week, Buster Murdahl released a statement through his father's attorney saying, quote, these baseless rumors of my involvement with Stephen and his death are false. I unequivocally deny any involvement in his death and my heart goes out to the Smith family. Those words are now in cement. I take him at his word that he had nothing at all to do with Stephen's death. Rather than old rumors, Bland and Richter say they're focusing on a new investigation made possible by $130,000 in GoFundMe donations from Sandy supporters. The resources were made available for us to do some private investigative work that's going to start with hiring a pathology team. They were also able to have Stephen's body exhumed, something Sandy had wanted for years. Our primary function right now is to have a true independent set of eyes look at it and tell us once and for all what really happened to Stephen Smith. In April of 2023, Dr. Michelle Dupree, a former investigator and forensic pathologist who's performed more than 3,000 autopsies, oversaw the examination of Stephen's body. The injuries can tell us so much about what happened. And in this case, they did. I did. Dupree says the autopsy confirmed Stephen died from a single blow to his forehead, severely fracturing his skull. That's a big gash. That's seven and a half inches almost. There would be another gash in this posterior area from hitting the pavement so hard. It literally split his skull. And split his skull. They were also able to put to rest some rumors, including the one that Stephen had been beaten with a baseball bat. It wasn't a baseball bat. No. But those type of injuries would cause something that we call pattern injuries, and we don't see that here. This is a linear fracture, um, as well as this is here. Just as important as what they found, Dupree says, is what they didn't find. We didn't find fractures of any part of the body except for the head. There was a little road rash, which you would expect. Any signs of a struggle? No. Any signs of a beating? No. Any injuries below his head other than the road rash? None whatsoever. She says that eliminates the possibility Stephen was hit by a car head on. Dupree says the findings also refute early theories that Stephen's body might have been staged. Were you able to determine whether Stephen was struck and fell or he might have been struck and then placed there? We don't believe that he was placed there. We believe that whatever happened, happened right there. Dr. Kenny Kinsey agrees. You think he was killed right here? Right there. A crime scene expert and star prosecution witness in the Murdahl murder trial, Kinsey worked with Dupree to analyze Stephen's case. He says the evidence at the scene is clear. That's a massive amount of blood. And if he had that kind of injury somewhere else, it wouldn't be that uniform. Due to their sensitive nature, we created versions of the crime scene photos in which the blood and body are shown as graphics. The quantity of blood, the direction of the flow in the road, and then the direction of all the, the blood on his person led me to the only conclusion. Kinsey's convinced an object attached to a vehicle traveling at high speed caused the single fatal blow to Stephen's head. But whatever hit him was fast and it was large. So a hit and run, but an atypical hit and run. Yeah, very atypical. A hit and run with no vehicle debris at the scene. It's a conclusion no one was expecting. How confident are you that you know what happened to Stephen Smith that night? 
I'm as close to a degree of scientific certainty as I've ever felt. What no one can say with certainty is whether Stephen's death was accidental or not. But still, Richter points out, he was left there to die. Someone left him in that condition in the roadway, and that is a very serious felony. Stephen's body was found about three miles from his car. Kinsey tried to retrace his steps. I wanted to walk every possible path that Mr. Smith may have taken. Stephen's family has always insisted if Stephen had car trouble, he would have felt safer walking through the woods. So where was Stephen's car? Stephen's car was located, if you look at this gate here, it was not grown up then. You could access that gate, but in this area, really close to the woods. But to cut through the woods, Stephen would have had to scale a fence that was eight feet tall. And from what I understand from interviewing neighbors, it's been there for well over a decade. Kinsey theorizes Stephen was walking along the road, trying to flag someone down for help. He is walking this direction in the, in the lane facing traffic. Whatever was attached to the vehicle or hanging off of the vehicle, whenever it struck Stephen, he went down in, in this area. Somewhat on this line. Here. The vehicle that struck Stephen was coming toward him, just like that vehicle in the photograph. Like this? Yes, going that direction. Kinsey says the evidence suggests the driver saw something in the road and changed lanes. And sometime before it struck Stephen, I believe it changed into the oncoming lane. That's when he says an object from the passenger side struck Stephen. What kind of object could it be? It could be anything. It could be a ladder hanging off the back of a work truck. It could be a extended side mirror, the metal type that you see on some farm vehicles or some larger vehicles. That scenario matches up with the tip from 2015 involving Patrick Wilson and Sean Connolly, which Kinsey calls plausible. That certainly would be possible. That would be one of the places I would start. SLED has kept its investigation close to the vest, but Bland and Richter say a grand jury was impaneled and is issuing subpoenas. They're honing in on specific individuals, and I think there's about five or less that SLED believes has information regarding Stephen's death. We don't know who those individuals are. In an interview on Fox Nation in August of 2023, Buster Murdahl again denied the rumors of his involvement. I never had anything to do with his murder, and I never had anything to do with him on a physical level of, of any regard. He also provided an alibi. The night Stephen was killed, I was at our Edisto Beach house. With your family? With my mom and my brother. Sandy's team says it's turned over all of its findings to SLED, but Kinsey says it's still going to take someone coming forward. Somebody knows. Oh, they know. Yes, ma'am. Do you think Stephen's death was an accident or intentional? See a timeline of the case at 48hours.com. As a grand jury zeroes in on potential suspects in Stephen Smith's death, the legal wrangling hasn't slowed down for Alec Murdaugh. You've got local charges, you've got state charges. The legal civil cases are going to go on for years. On November 17, 2023, I am guilty, and yes, sir. Murdaugh agreed to a plea deal encompassing all of the state financial charges he faced for defrauding and stealing millions from clients and law partners. He had previously pleaded guilty to 22 federal conspiracy, wire fraud, and money laundering charges. Alex preyed on the vulnerable, whom he also thought would never figure out his schemes. Correct. It's people that are at the worst times of their lives, where you need a lawyer to be the best for you, not the worst for you. Perhaps none more so than Elena and Hannah Plyler, who are now represented by Blandon Richter. Who are the Plylers? They were two young girls from uh, Columbia. 
They were just 12 and 8 when they survived a deadly crash due to a faulty tire that killed their mother and 14-year-old brother in 2005 and became the youngest of the financial victims to whom Myrtle admitted he lied and stole from when questioned at his murder trial. What loss did they suffer? Who died? Uh, their mother. Their mother did. He only mentioned your mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that bothered me. That Because hurt. you don't remember that a 14-year-old was killed in that wreck. Alec got a very good paycheck off of my brother's death. Both women are now mothers, and Elena is a detective with the Lexington County Sheriff's Office. Since all of this has come out, there's a lot of pain that's still there. Elena was old enough to remember the details of the last road trip she and her sister would ever take with their mom and brother. My brother and I had gotten into an argument. I wanted to start sitting in the front seat. And we fought about it and fought about it. And finally, mom was like, you know what? Justin's mm -hmm. going to ride on the way to Columbia. And on the way back home, Elena gets to ride up front. And I was so happy. Elena and Hannah, who were still sitting in the back seat, survived the crash. So you must think yeah. about that all the time. I do. I actually had a lot of guilt for several years. That guilt is something she says she's learned to let go as she recounts her and her little sister's harrowing survival. We hadn't been on the road too long. Hannah was sleeping and I was listening to Usher. And I remember mom saying, Lainey, you awake? And so I remember pulling my headphones down. I said, yeah, mom. Within seconds, I heard this loud pop. And then I immediately heard my mom scream. I looked out the window and my Usher CD was spinning on a tree limb. Their mother, Angela, and brother, Justin, died instantly. Elena realized she was trapped and couldn't move and had to send Hannah for help. I said, I need you to get out of the car and I need you to go to the top of the hill to the interstate. And you're only 12. I'm 12, right. It, so many things could have went worse. Eight-year-old Hannah climbed up to the interstate. There was an 18-wheeler, and I was able to flag him down. And I think by that point, an ambulance came, and, and they had taken me to the hospital. Elena waited alone until a fire rescue team arrived and cut her out of the wreckage. She watched as they removed her mother and brother. And so I watched them put them in a black body bag. She was then airlifted to a hospital and would need numerous surgeries. What was the moment like when you were able to see each other again after that? <laughs> I remember it. I remember hugging her and thanking her for not dying, for not leaving me. And then from there, I was just in the hospital bed with you. You, you couldn't keep us apart. The sisters say they were passed around to live with family members. We didn't have a bedroom. Mm -hmm. We just had each other. We just, just had each, each other. other. Yeah. yeah, we lived out of little plastic bins. When a family friend referred the Plylers to Alec Murdahl, he promised to change all of that. Do you remember the first time you met Alec Murdahl? Yeah. I remember when he walked in, he seemed really arrogant, like a bulldog, just tall, almost yeah. intimidating in a sense. He told us, they took your family from you and we're going to make this right. They're going to pay. To two young girls who had lost everything, Murdahl seemed larger than life. I always felt at peace when I got to talk to Alec. People listened to him. You could tell there was a lot of control there. How did he earn your trust? Really, with his words, he was a smooth talker, and he made you feel special. But once the case settled, the special treatment stopped. He pretty much checked out. He had explained that the case had settled. We won big money. Well, Lania's case settled for $4.7 million, you know, Hannah's for right at $3 million. Uh, that money was then entrusted to Russell Lafitte. Lafitte was the CEO of Palmetto State Bank in Hampton and a close friend of Murdahl, who'd handpicked Lafitte to manage the funds as conservator until the girls turned 18. So these two very wealthy, prominent men basically helped themselves to these kids' piggy bank. Any money they needed had to be approved by Lafitte and a judge. Even if it was a dollar, we had to have a receipt for it. When you and Eric took on their case, what did you discover? Russell was making loans to Alex. Alex would be overdrawn 
50000 $100,000, $300,000 in his personal account, and he needed money to cover those shorts. Richter says that at Murdahl's direction, Lafitte transferred nearly $1.5 million from the Plyler's money to Alec Murdahl and himself. When it came time for these young ladies to turn 18, the money was supposed to be there. So Alex had to go out and steal new money from different clients and put that money back. Murdahl was never charged for Hannah and Elena's case, but Lafitte was convicted on federal charges for his role. But still, there's that toll of how do you trust going forward? People were put in a position of trust on their behalf when they were just children. And then to learn as an adult that uh, the entire time they saw you as nothing more than a checkbook. While the plylers can begin to heal, Sandy Smith still waits for her day of reckoning. All this sweeping drama, there's answers and there's closure for everybody else, but not for Sandy Smith. It's time to put the spotlight on Stephen Smith. Months after his blockbuster trial, Alec Murdoch! Verdict guilty. Convicted double murderer Alec Murdoch and the crime of the century are still Hampton's biggest attractions. Almost every day somebody's coming by taking a picture of the law firm or riding out to Moselle taking pictures. They just can't get enough. The Murdoch craze was on full display at an auction for the family's personal items from their Moselle property. The infamous leather couch set where Alec testified he took a cat nap while his wife and son were murdered sold for $30,000. And Maggie's dog Bubba, who helped prosecutors prove Alec was actually at the crime scene, has become a local folk hero. If that rambunctious yellow lab hadn't have been doing what labs like to do, chase birds, we might not have solved this case and we might not have gotten a conviction. Alex's voice calling Bubba was caught in the background of phone video Paul took minutes before he was killed. Bubba and the other dogs at the kennels, they were witnesses to a very horrific event. Bubba now lives a quiet life with the Murdahl's housekeeper. Meanwhile, Alec Murdahl is serving two life terms in a maximum security prison. Do you think Alec Murdahl still thinks he can try to play the system? 100%. Now, Murnell's attorneys are hoping their latest motion will be a get out of jail free card. We're focused on getting him a new trial. That's In September 2023, Dick Harputlian and Jim Griffin announced their motion for a new trial based on allegations of jury tampering by the Colleton County Clerk of Court, Becky Hill. What we had filed today, supported by sworn testimony of jurors, is that the Clerk of Court had improper private communications with the jurors. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant. They argued that Hill violated Murdoch's right to a fair trial when she allegedly told jurors not to be fooled by his testimony and to watch his body language as Alec was about to take the stand. I'm Alec Murdoch. In a signed affidavit, Hill denies all of the defense allegations and voluntary statements from a majority of the jury support Hill's account. Richter and Bland say even a new trial can save Alec Murdahl. If the murder conviction's overturned, then you have the financial crimes. According to the plea deal with prosecutors on the state crimes, Murdahl could be sentenced to nearly 30 years for those charges alone. So, yes, there's a theoretical universe in, in which Alex Murdahl could see the sun again, but it's theoretical only. It's like rearranging the, the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's futile. Yeah. If you were to write a made-for-TV Southern legal drama, you, you couldn't have done a better job than this. DeWitt writes about it in his book, The Fall of the House of Murdahl, which he ends with Stephen Smith. It's kind of interesting and tragic that the oldest story remains unsolved. Solving his murder, I think this will be the end of this sweeping saga. As SLED continues its investigation of the Smith case behind closed doors, 
what investigators found after the Murdahl murders remains the subject of intense speculation. Do you have any idea what the new evidence that may be presented to the grand jury is? No. Uh, I do know that SLED has Stephen's phone. I know that they have Stephen's tablet. Could Stephen's phone reveal the identity of the prominent person with whom he told Sandy he'd planned to go deep sea fishing? That'll be interesting what SLED has found out and what the grand jury is going to determine whether the person that he was going to go away with deep sea fishing um, had anything to do with his death or has knowledge of his death. How has this fight for justice been? Oh, it has been a long road, but it's worth it. Sandy is keeping the faith and keeping Stephen's memory alive. She recently established a college scholarship in his name. We are starting this scholarship fund so other children won't have it as hard as Stephen did. And she's offering a $30,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. And now it's your turn that if you know something, that you say something. What do you miss most about Stephen? Oh, just, I miss everything about him. What do you think Stephen would think of your fight where we are today in his case? He said, oh, Mama, you would do that for me? Yep. Yep, I would, over and over. A couple's financial hardship becomes a prelude to murder. Someone's trying to break into my home. But only one of them pays the price. The last thing that most burglars want to encounter are people. Secrets and deadly deception. You can just tell there's information that's missing. We're not getting the full story. 48 Hours, Saturday on CBS, streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Real people. Real crimes. Real life drama. It was a savage murder. That was probably one of the most brutal that I've seen. The brutality of this was what stunned us all. But to cut a woman's throat, it's revenge, it's anger. Somebody hated her. Take a look at this. She's gorgeous, isn't she? Full of life. Just a little sweetheart. And once you knew her, you loved her forever. Can you give me her whole name? Her maiden name, Eva K. Smith, Eva K. Judd, Eva K. Wilson, Eva K. Gilbert, Eva K. Winnell. Each time did she think, okay, this guy, this is gonna be the one? I guess. <laughs> she was the wife of Hal Wennell, and Hal was a real estate developer. He was very wealthy, successful businessman. He was a jet setter. He ran in a fast crowd of big money. He liked very pretty women, and he liked the glitter of life. I'm Ned Timmons, and my team was hired by Hal Wennell to investigate the death of his wife. How would you all describe this case? Puzzling, uh, frustrating. You want to right the wrong. Somebody is out there that took this lady's life, and it's our job to try and find them. This incident happened on uh, May 1st, 2008. K-10 was at home. She hadn't been feeling well. I think it was right over in this area is where the first encounter happened. The attack at the front door was brutal. And then I think he just, like, hits her like this. Somebody hit her with a prize fighter type punch and just smashed her face in. I think she recovered and ran for the kitchen. She was running for her life. And I think this is where the, the perpetrator, the assailant, got her. 
caught her from behind, forced her to the ground. And then, and then cut her neck. I believe Hal came home around 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night and found Kay. What's the hardest part about losing your sister this way? She was my best friend. How could somebody do that to somebody like her? We have found people have three lives. They have a public life, a private life, and a secret life. Do you believe Kay Wennell had a secret life? I, I believe she did, yes. And that's where I believe the answer lies. I'm Erin Moriarty. Tonight on 48 Hours, who killed Kay Wennell? Forty-eight hours. We'll be back in ninety seconds. Why are you talking to me? I'm talking to you because I want to find out who murdered my sister. At the time of her murder, Kay was married to real estate developer Hal Wennell, her fourth husband. He was smitten from the moment he first set eyes on Kay in a Reno airport. She said she bent over to get luggage off the rack, and that's when Hal noticed her. <laughs> How could you not? <laughs> Pam Sleeper says her sister was striking and vivacious. Hal was proud of her. He used to love to walk into restaurants. She was arm candy. Oh, look at that woman. Wow. And at the age of 60, Kay was still turning heads. And everyone seemed to love her which made her murder in May 2008 all the more shocking and difficult to solve. What's more, there is little physical evidence. Crime scene investigators took this video, which reveals no fingerprints, footprints, defensive wounds, hairs, or fibers, and all the blood tested was Kay's. So three weeks after his wife's death, Hal Wennell offered a reward that would grow to a quarter of a million dollars. He wanted to try to find out who murdered Kay, and he was willing to pay dearly to do it. But when months went by without a real lead, the frustrated multimillionaire hired his own team of private investigators led by Ned Timmons. We want this guy. We want this salt. Timmons, a retired FBI agent, recruited former colleagues, his own ex-wife Kathleen, and John and Sonia. You know, when you get involved in this kind of work, you want to have closure, you want to bring them to a, an end. We brought them together with retired Gwinnett County Police Lieutenant Charlie Bishop, who also worked on this case, to re-examine a murder that continues to haunt them all. So can this be solved? Oh, I think it can. We need that lucky break. Normally, we follow a murder case after an arrest has been made, but not tonight. Tonight's report is a true whodunit, so listen closely. Maybe you know something that can solve this case. May 1st, 2008 wasn't a typical day for Kay Wennell. She woke up that morning with all the intentions of going to work. Usually, she was out finding tenants to fill her husband's shopping centers. And she changed her mind, saying, I don't feel well. So whoever did this knew that she was home. There are no signs of forced entry. This is where you believe. 
yeah. the assailant came in. Is that yes, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So John and Sonia believes Kay let her killer inside and was immediately assaulted. The proof, says Ned Timmons, is all that blood. And you can see by the way the blood drop was hit, her back had to be there, and he had to hit her with a very, very powerful blow there that stunned her. And sent her glasses flying across the room. She realized, I'm in trouble, and then tried to escape. She flees to the kitchen, perhaps to get the phone. There he gets her, and that's where he takes control of her and kills her. By slashing her throat. What happened next shocked even these veteran investigators. Then he decided to do what we call an insurance cut, a second cut. To make sure that she was going to die. I mean, that's a cold blood. Exactly killing. right. Yeah, it really is. And Kay's killer appeared to have carefully planned his attack. Nobody saw him coming in. Nobody saw him leave. Which makes what the killer left behind so puzzling. There's the bloody towel up in the upstairs bedroom. A towel with smudges of Kay's blood was found in her closet off the master bathroom. Why is he in there? It's her closet. Maybe he takes one final trophy. What are you looking for in that room? It's a big question. This is what investigators do know. The weapon. I think it might have been a scalpel or something like that. Could have been a hunting or fishing knife. Whatever it was, it was extremely sharp. It did not cause any jagged lacerations. It was like The assailant. You all use he. You believe a man did this? Because of the strength that it took. I don't see a woman cutting another woman's throat like that. You know, are there women that could do this? Sure, I don't think it's likely. I think this was a man. A man that John and Sonia believes is right-handed. Because I think he hit her with his right, and I think the way they, the, the cuts were on her neck, it started from here to here. And if he was left-handed, I think he would start here and go this way. And he was probably wearing gloves. Pieces of a latex glove were found inside the house and on the back deck that didn't match ones used by first responders. That also is confirmation that whoever did this came prepared. I mean, who walks oh. around with rubber gloves in their pocket? The motive. Everyone agrees this was not a robbery. She had plenty of rings on. Kay's wallet and credit cards were out in the open. Jewelry worth hundreds of thousands of dollars was locked in a safe upstairs. If this was some guy that came to rob her, wouldn't he take the rings? Wouldn't he take something? The impressions that I got were that someone was very comfortable in that home, knew their way around that home, and this person has no concern that anyone is going to walk in and catch him, and then walks out the back door and departs. Investigators believe the killer made his escape through the woods behind the Wenall home. He clearly knew where he was going to when he left. And that takes an awful lot of prior planning. But did he make a mistake? Who is this? Don't know, but I sure wished I did. I'm thinking, is this the guy that murdered my sister? Six days after Kay Wano was murdered, her family and friends gathered to say goodbye. It was packed, lots of people. There was a lot of policemen there. Gwinnett County Police took this surveillance footage. They were searching the faces for suspects. Pam Sleeper was searching for answers. Did Kay have enemies? I didn't think she did, but apparently she did. Did she ever talk about having any fears? No. no. Anybody threatening her? No. You had to wonder about Hal, didn't you? No. It just never crossed my mind, ever. 
but it certainly occurred to police to look at Kay's husband. Hal was a suspect from day one. Hal, however, appeared eager to cooperate, agreeing to this police interview in 2008 without his lawyer present. To the best of my knowledge, I will tell you everything I know. And as investigators discovered, Hal had an ironclad alibi. We knew Hal physically wasn't there. We have video of him leaving his office. We have video of him going to a fast food restaurant, all within the time we believe the murder took place. There was also no evidence Hal had hired anyone. What's more, he seemed grief-stricken by Kay's death. And there are nights I wake up crying my heart out, middle of the night, like a child. It's horrible. It's, right. it's, it's really horrible, and especially if you don't know why, if she was hit by a car. Hal wasn't a part of this, in my opinion. So you don't believe he was involved? No, but I think Hal was protecting the memory of Kay. The secret she, stuff. The secret stuff, and he didn't want to divulge that because it would reflect poorly on, on Kay. Secrets Kay didn't even share with her sister Pam. There was a whole lot apparently she didn't talk to me about. And do you think somewhere in there is the clue to her killer? Mm -hmm. I sure do. Kay had a colorful past. As investigators discovered, she not only married a lot, she also had affairs. She needed to be loved, and she needed to feel that she could attract any man. She, she was obsessed with this. In fact, Ned Timmons theorizes she may have been seeing someone at the time of her death. Hal knew her secret life. Hal was involved in the secret life, in my opinion. Do you think he put up with her then having affairs just to keep Absolutely. her on his arm? Absolutely, yeah. In a murder investigation, nothing is private. So the Wendell House was searched, and according to John and Sonia, more possible evidence of Kay's secret life was uncovered. Material we found in the house. Right. Which would, would not be normal. In what way? What do you mean? It was unusual, uh, almost perverted. Kinky? So, kinky, yes, kinky is a good word. Outfits detectives described as fetish wear. And when we talked to Hal about it, first he said, no, I don't know anything about that stuff. Oh, and then the next time, Oh, yeah, we went to a, uh, a masquerade party and she dressed like a French maid. But this Halloween costume is tame compared to what else was found in Kay's closet. The list in police reports is X-rated. These outfits were not something a French maid would wear. And if she's not wearing them for Hal, then who's she wearing them for? Kay is a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. If you came out and I'd line up, 30 guys I know, they'd all tell you the same thing. Anybody, any guy would fall in love with Kay in a minute. Do you believe she knew her killer? I think she probably did. And cops do have one possible clue to his identity. A stranger seen in this neighborhood the very afternoon Kay was killed. This sketch was made with help from one of the Wendell's neighbors, who told police he actually saw the same man twice, on the day of the murder and the day before. And he had a, a flyer for a house that was for sale in the subdivision, and the neighbor said, oh, it's way on the other side. And he just turned around and he walked away out of sight. The first encounter stood out to the neighbor because the stranger didn't seem to have a car. Now, this is an area you just don't walk around in a neighborhood. You, you have to drive. Nobody, nobody walks. Police later discovered that the house for sale flyer was only given to people who had been inside that house. And there had been no showings on the day the stranger first appeared. The following day, the same neighbor was looking out his bathroom window. And he sees the same guy walking toward Wendell's house right about the time they believed that the homicide occurred. I mean, do you think this person could be the killer? I think it's a strong possibility. Obviously, we can't say for 100% until we identify that person he saw. 
And for more than eight years, that's exactly what Gwinnett County Police have been trying to do. Sergeant John Richter took over the investigation in 2011. Lieutenant Stephen Shaw is his supervisor. It's a standard, you know, white male with wire rimmed glasses that's aging and starting to bald. And there are probably hundreds and hundreds of males walking around that look something like this. And, and we've, you know, obviously explored Kay's inner circle and, and Hal's circle and, and all of their friends and acquaintances. They checked out everyone, from Kay's doctor to a restaurant manager, even a clerk at the local Hobby Lobby store who had a crush on Kay. She said, that's the strangest thing. He calls me and wants me to go for a drink with him. Investigators have cleared and eliminated all three men but they're still trying to find this man, pictured with Kay in a photo taken years earlier in Las Vegas, who seemed to resemble the sketch. Do you think that person is this person? Well, I think it's a possibility that that person is seated next to Kay and with another female, it, it, it for sure could be him. You don't know whether he's a suspect or not. You just- I, I never could identify him. Yes. Nobody seemed to know who he was. As investigators were searching for the man in the sketch, Hal suggested they should also look at a man in Kay's past. <sighs> no, I have something back in my mind, I don't even want to say it yet, that that was years and years ago. Yeah. Uh, the, the weirdest thing was, uh, and I, I really don't even like saying it, is her ex-husband. Her third husband, Jeff Gilbert. Was she still married to him when you, when you two met? When we met, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, she was. He was running Bally's Casino, where Kay was modeling, when Hal swept in and stole her away. He threatened her when she was trying to leave. Uh, I know that. Uh, but that's what she told me, so. You don't think that would make Jeff angry enough to want to kill her? No. No. Either. No. Never. But just a few months before Kay was killed, Jeff called. He was traveling to Atlanta and wanted to see her and Hal. I said, well, what are you gonna do? Huh? She said, I told him we're not going. She said, he's livid about it. We looked at him because an ex-husband is, is, of course, on our suspect list, but no indication that he was involved. We don't have any evidence through airlines or phone records, and we looked into it to indicate that he was in the Atlanta area. Then, Nearly three months after Kay was killed, out of the blue, the most tantalizing and perplexing clue of all. I was in shock. I, I didn't know what to think. Forty-eight hours, the thirtieth season. From Russia with murder. I was hired to hunt down Victoria Nasirova. She allegedly killed Nadia Ford's mother. From the streets of Russia. You need to speak Russian too. Victoria, CBS News. To the streets of New York. There are allegations that Victoria has left a trail of victims. She was going to continue drugging and poisoning people to get what she wanted. Tracking her mother's killer. I fear for my own life. She's pure evil. The Widow. County 911. Help me! Help me! My husband's hurt himself! Was it a homicide or was it a suicide? There were three shots. This is not a comfortable way it's to not. kill yourself. It's not. What do you believe happened to David Lee? Rainella Leith killed him. No. Anyone see her pick up the gun? No. Fingerprints? No. That's a problem, isn't it? What about her first husband? He was trampled by his own cattle. Ah. She'd been charged with the murder of two husbands. They called her the Black Widow. Were you at all prepared for what happened in this case? Shock is the word that comes to mind. Grapes of Wrath. He calls 911 and he's yelling into the phone, help me, help me, he shot me. The shooter is in the truck, shooting out the window. Who are these guys? 
Greetings from Doll Vineyards. Robert was almost too good to be true. Ema, golden boy at Cisco, who was starstruck about getting into the Napa Valley wine business. And Ema's dream crossed paths with Robert Doll's dream. This is over money. $800,000 in a gym bag? Yeah. This is what $800,000 in cash looks like. Did you ever imagine that this is how it was going to end? A new season, 48 hours. I stand on that bridge on, on the second floor. I look down at that front door. I say, Kay, what happened here? What, what really happened? Whoever did this did this because one of two reasons. They're very angry with her, or they're very angry with you. I've been yeah. in this game for 40 years. Who the hell kills your wife? Not even the mafia does that. Despite what Hal Wendell believed, cold case investigators Lieutenant Stephen Shaw and Sergeant John Richter wonder if the killer could be connected in some way to Wendell's business. We have to look at every option and every possibility so we figure out who did it. Back in 2008, Hal was the picture of wealth and success. At the time of Kay's death, what kind of shape was his business in? It's hard to tell. In the face, it looks like they had a lot of money. However, after digging into the case, it appears that it was maybe smoke and mirrors. We find out that maybe there was some fraud or some stuff that wasn't always on the up and ups. Hal Wendell made his fortune buying land, building shopping centers, and then selling the malls fully leased for a profit. But according to Marie Lundquist, Hal would sometimes cook the books. He wasn't the most honest person in the world. Marie began working for Hal in 2007 as his administrative assistant. We sold a shopping center in Lawrenceville, and the whole deal was bad. He was paying tenants rent, so when the new owners bought it, the books looked like they were paying rent every month, when, in fact, Hal was paying their rent, some of them. Yeah, I can say to you it without reservation, I can't even think of anybody. We have tenants occasionally who fall out, but they don't blame me. Yet we found six lawsuits filed against Hal and his various companies, some of them from people who did blame him, claiming fraud, but Hal brushed it off. If you don't make any money, you never get sued for anything. The minute you make a buck, people come after you. Do you think there's any possibility that the Kay's death might have something to do with someone angry with Hal? Yeah, because apparently he owed a lot of people money and he didn't make a lot of friends. Could be a revenge thing. Kay's sister Pam wonders if an investor was angry enough to hire a professional killer, which could explain the lack of evidence at the crime scene. There was a lot of blood there, and how this guy got away with about a footprint, a hand mark on the wall, or anything, I, it's just amazing. But the idea of a professional hit doesn't make sense to the investigators who've examined the case over the years. I think if it was hired killer, it would have been a yeah gun with a gun, yeah, no physical contact to the back of just the head. Yeah. Boom, boom, bye. Out the door. See you later. That's it. I'm done. And what makes the hitman even more unlikely, they say, is what happened nearly three months after Kay was murdered. A peculiar letter arrived at the Gwinnett County offices of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The letter wasn't published back then, but it was given to the police. The police department wanted to meet with us. They showed us this letter. Cut out in little bitty, individual, different letters out of different magazines, all glued in to this page and it was shocking. The envelope, postmarked July 21st, 2008, had been mailed from Augusta, Georgia, some 140 miles away from where Kay was murdered. 
Wow. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it was bizarre, odd. The letter and envelope were taken apart and carefully examined by the crime lab, but no DNA or other useful forensics were found. Whoever did this did it with, with gloves on. I mean, they, they cut each individual letters out and then glued them. So it was very time consuming to do that. Do you know how hard that would be to stick these oh, things all these in are, there with plastic gloves Oh, it's incredible. On? I mean, this is really a long, I mean, just to go through the magazine. The letter is shocking, filled with expletives. I bet Kay Wendell never told anyone what she really was. It turns out she was just a money-grubbing money whore. whore. I loved her, and she said we could be together. She told me she hated her house in that fat, miserable, lying mother... I'm effing husband. She said she loved me, but that was a lie, too. I told her this would happen if she didn't, didn't keep... keep her damn promises to me. Her family screwed everything up. Those white trash ass... His money was more important than our love. We could have been so happy together, but they everything up. On its face, it sounds like the words of a jilted lover. If you look at the letter, yeah. if we're going to go with the, the jilted lover theory, yeah. uh, that this person, uh, she finally told him, no, I'm staying with Hal. In other words, did, did the family talk her into staying with Hal that irritated the actual perpetrator? But Pam Sleeper says Kay never mentioned any plans to leave Hal. Although she admits parts of the letter have a ring of truth, especially about the house they were renting. I know that she didn't like her house. I mean, that was the first thing that stood out to me was, wow. I know she was kind of unhappy with Hal about that. So it was someone who knew her. Oh, yeah, apparently. Who would go to such trouble? Is the letter really what it appears to be? How many of you believe this was actually written by a spurn lover? Do you? Based on the reading of it, yes. Kathleen? I don't. I do because of the reference to the family, the house, and things, things that wouldn't be known to everybody. But those are exactly why it wouldn't be a spurned lover. A spurned lover doesn't give a care about her house. A spurned lover doesn't give a care about her family. I believe at this point it's not a jilted lover. That's a red herring. Review the clues. Help solve this case. Join us now on Facebook at 48 Hours. A special 48 Hours podcast series on Radio.com. The Widow, six episodes starting Tuesday. One woman, two dead husbands. Could she be that unlucky? The investigation into Kay Wennell's death got new life when this letter arrived in July of 2008. It felt like something dreamed up by a Hollywood screenwriter. It's what the author thinks threat letters should look like. This is almost scripted. So you have to say, what's the purpose? Former FBI profiler Mary Ellen O'Toole agreed to examine the letter for us. She now heads the forensic science program at George Mason University. This is someone I think that's pretending to be the killer to create this boogeyman suspect and to push the police away from the actual motive in the case. The writer may not be a jilted lover at all. From working cases like this, if this was a spurned lover, then this would not be the first note. A spurned lover is going to have notes preceding this one where Kay is the most wonderful thing in the world, I love you, we're perfect together, even if it's a delusional stalker. Initially, they love their victims. They're beautiful. They're going to spend their life together. It's only after a few letters that you see that transition to, you are now this horrible human being. I hate you. What's more, the investigation hasn't revealed any other men in Kay's life, exactly what Hal told detectives back in 2008. As God is my judge, I don't think Kay was having an affair or she had a the best damn actress in the world. It turns out that while Kay was sexy and flirtatious, 
Investigators may have been looking in the wrong direction. They didn't find any evidence of an affair at the time of her murder. And Kathleen Timmons says neither did the medical examiner. And this letter that implies that she's got yet a very active current lover. And yet when they, they did the autopsy examination, she had no indication that, that there had been recent sexual activity. There's no indication that she's involved with anybody, including her husband. Do you believe that the person who sent this letter is actually the person who went into the home and killed her? Not necessarily. O'Toole suspects the killer may have had help. I think it's possible that there are um, two people that could be involved. You could have somebody that wrote the letter and then someone that came into the home. Mary Ellen O'Toole says writers of cut and paste notes tend to have one thing in common. They are women. I can tell you that that's my experience. I've seen them written by teenage girls. I've seen them written by middle-aged women. But the behavior at the scene, just that kind of violence, certainly suggests to me a male offender. If the profiler is right, that means a man and a woman could be involved in Kay's death, with the woman creating the note to throw police off the trail. Someone may have been interviewed and they felt like they could have been considered a suspect, didn't want that, and produced this note. Isn't this a very risky thing? A terribly risky thing to do. O'Toole suggests taking another look at the people interviewed by police back in 2008. One of those people was this woman, a friend of Kay's and Howe's, Karen Scott. Karen worked for Hal, and she promoted herself as Hal's right-hand man. And Karen was an obvious suspect of ours because she was close with Hal and Kay. In any investigation, you're going to start with who's closest to them. So close that when Karen remarried, it was Kay who gave the wedding shower and was matron of honor. Marie Lundquist was there. Oh my gosh, it was a gorgeous wedding. Hal walked her down the aisle. And the day Kay was killed, Investigators discovered Hal and a colleague had brought breakfast to Karen, who was home recovering from surgery. And later, when he discovered Kay's body, Karen was his first call. She was destroyed because she and Kay were like very, very, I mean, extremely close. That's Karen Scott on police surveillance tape at Kay's funeral. You know, things change. Back then, we thought she was a good source. She would email me, wanting to be kept up on what was going on. All seemingly innocent that may not be. Documents show Karen had ongoing financial problems, but Hal was a generous boss. The money was great. I don't think she could have made that kind of money elsewhere. And she was ambitious. We looked into Karen, we looked into every other person at work, who was closest to Kay, Hal, what they would gain if Kay was out of the picture. According to this police report, Karen admitted to detectives that with Kay's death, she possibly gained the opportunity to operate the company. But she also denied that she would have had any motivation to bring harm to Kay over those facts. And she described herself as Kay's best friend. And when I heard that, I was like, Really? I mean, that surprised me. Kay's sister and best friend, Pam Sleeper. <laughs> you know, I know a best friend, and their relationship was not like my best friend's. Some work colleagues also question how close they really were. They were not best friends. Maybe to her face, but that's not what she was saying behind Kay's back. We reached out to Karen Scott, and she sent us this letter stating, I lost my best friend to a brutal attack, but she declined our request for an interview. Karen has been questioned by investigators about Kay Wendell's death, and according to police reports, she adamantly denied any and all involvement. What's more, police say cell phone records back Karen's alibi that she was home around the time of the murder. And Richter says he's unable to connect her to the letter. We investigated that thoroughly, and, and, and quite frankly, we're still investigating it. But we can't find anything to suggest that Karen was responsible for the letter or that anybody in particular was responsible for that letter. With an unknown assailant still on the loose, Pam Sleeper says her determination to find her sister's killer 
comes with risks. I do walk around kind of scared sometimes. I wonder if he's going to be after me next because I don't give it up. You think because you keep her name alive and you keep this case alive that somebody might come after you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was the last picture taken of Kay on her 60th birthday. Pam Sleeper says that after Kay's murder, Hal Wennell was never the same. He called me every day. He was just lost. He missed her so much. He would say, who? Why? And I was like, I, I don't know how. It's what we're trying to find out. I try to stay busy morning, noon, night. I hate the mornings going to work because I know I'm coming home to that house at night. Weekends, I despise. Hal may have hated being in the house, but he refused to leave it. If your wife or significant other was murdered in that house, wouldn't you want to get out of that house? Private investigator Ned Timmons. Do you want to walk in the kitchen every day and have this vision of all this blood and her lying there with her throat cut? You know, it just didn't make sense. Still more perplexing to investigators, how kept the house exactly as it was the day Kay was killed? Her sneakers next to the living room couch. Her book open to the page she was reading. Drops of her blood on the staircase. It was never cleaned up. Even when our team showed up months and months later, yeah. the house it was, was very exactly... Strange. Very strange. They, very exactly strange. the way it was. You'd think you'd have a cleaning crew come in and cleanse it all that up. place, but yeah. there was still the blood splatters. I want nothing more on God's earth than to find the guy who did this, and I'd give everything I have to get Case Keller. Even if it meant spending his fortune to do it. The Gwinnett County Police Department was having their financial difficulties. So it was really a bad time for law enforcement. Is that part of the problem here that it's They're a problem everywhere. There was just no money there. Again, another reason Hal contacted these folks, because they had so much more resources available to him than we did. Ned Timmons says it was Hal who paid for much needed lab work to be done. I was dealing with a private laboratory weekly, and we sent a lot of fibers, we sent a lot of fluids for DNA sampling, and Hal would have to approve every yeah. Every time, samplings are five, 6,000 a hit. And we had people in Las Vegas, we had people, leads in California, we had leads all over the country. It was costing him a lot of money. Yeah. Hal's quest came to an abrupt end in 2010 after he died of a heart attack. His estate cut off the $250,000 reward money and fired his private investigators. You know, there were things that we wanted to do, other leads that we wanted to follow up on. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the executor says, you guys are all finished. We weren't happy about it, I'll tell you that. As FBI agents, we don't ever want to quit. And we never wanted to just stop, but we couldn't afford to finance it ourselves. The current cold case detectives seem to have made no headway, and their investigation appears stalled. This case on the face of it looks like it would be solvable. Why is it still open? From the amount of time put into it and different investigators involved, I really don't have an answer for that. And that's the most frustrating part. And I think that's probably why we're here today, is that we'll get someone's attention and someone who knows something will call us. I know there's somebody out there that knows. And I think they just need to come forward and let us know, you know. It would just help so much. We'd be so grateful. Mm -hmm. As they've done so many times, Pam Sleeper, her mother, and their husbands made an emotional visit to Kay's grave. If it was me, Kay would not give up. <laughs> and I'm not gonna give up. Tonight, investigators are asking for your help to solve Kay Wennell's murder. Once again, here is what we know. She was at home in Lawrenceville, Georgia on May 1st, 2008, when she was viciously attacked. Investigators believe her assailant was a right-handed man wearing gloves who used a very sharp weapon. This unidentified man seen near the Wennell home the day of the murder may have been involved, 
And then there's the cut and paste letter sent nearly three months later. People who think they get away with murder sigh a big sigh of relief when years go by. But this program is going to make them very nervous. Anyone with information is asked to contact Gwinnett County Criminal Investigation Division, anonymous tip line, 1-770-513-5390. Crime Stoppers Atlanta, 1-404-577-TIPS. Basically, it's been a conflict-free life. He divided us. Not guilty of murder. He's guilty of sin. He defined us. The system balanced in favor of a black man. And still, we can't get past that. Now what? OJ would never lay low. Saturday at 9. It's been more than two weeks now since 24-year-old Jennifer Kessie disappeared. Jennifer has vanished. What could have happened? Where could Jennifer be? As the days pass by, there's been few answers and even fewer leads. Someone out there knows something. How could someone just vanish? But she did. Oh my god. Oh my god, this can't be happening. Detective, it's been 14 years. Where is Jennifer Kessie? We miss Jen every single day. Hello, I'm Jennifer Kessie. It's her laughter. It's her wit. Ah! It's just her loving nature. I think of her all the time. We were inseparable. Our friendship never wavered. Just the greatest friend I've ever had. In January 2006, Jen was on top of the world. She was in love. I remember Jennifer giving me a phone number. She's like, I don't ever do this. I could spend hours on the phone talking to her. Couldn't have been happier. She had a great job, had just gotten promoted. She had just bought her first condo with her own money. Life couldn't have been any better for her. On the morning of January 24th, 2006, we got a phone call. Was Jennifer okay? She didn't show up for work today. Totally out of character for Jennifer. So out of character. Something's wrong. Something was wrong. Was there any evidence of a forced entry? No. There was no blood on the ground? Mm -mm. The Orlando Police Department, they worked it very hard. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Lewis Bolden. Joyce and Drew Kessie organized searches. They were standing on street corners, holding signs, begging, pleading for anyone to please help them find their daughter. Nothing panned out. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. She's been missing for more than two years. 10 years ago. 12 long years. 13 years later. 14 years. Now it's our turn. So not only am I looking at Jennifer Kessie's parents, I'm looking at the two lead detectives right now on this case. Yes. Yes. Us and our team. I'm a private investigator, and I'm working for the Kessie family. We have to find her. <laughs> oh my god, we've got to find her. There are people out there who know exactly what happened to Jennifer Kessie.
you have any tips about the Jennifer Kessie case, you can contact the Kessie family tip line. We don't have her. We need her. Where is she? You know, aliens didn't abduct her. Please help us. To meet the Kessies is to love the Kessies. They're just good people. Lewis Bolden is an investigative reporter for WKMG in Orlando. He's covered the case since Jennifer Kessie went missing in 2006. Joyce and Drew Kessie were very vulnerable. It's just really hard. And you could sense that, you could feel that. We're a desperate family. And people just wanted to help them. I'll have the story all new at six. If you had told me then, in 14 years, we would still be looking for Jennifer Kessie, I would not have believed it. Um, can I just have a second? Lauren McCarthy and Jennifer were best friends since childhood. She was extremely safety conscious. She was very aware of her surroundings. She carried pepper spray with her all the time. The reasons that she bought the place that she did was because it was a gated community with a guard. On Sunday, January 22nd, 2006, Jennifer returned from a vacation to St. Croix with her boyfriend, Rob Allen. My best friend said to me after the trip, he's like, oh, you're in love and you just don't want to admit it. They had been dating a year. You've got the bug, you're all in. Even though Rob lived in Fort Lauderdale, about three hours from Jennifer's condo in Orlando. We did the long distance, but after the initial day, we started spending virtually every weekend together. On Monday, January 23rd, on her way into work as a project manager for a timeshare company, Jennifer called her mom. Jen shared every detail about the trip. She was just really happy. She was on a cloud. But that evening, Jennifer spoke with Rob, and their conversation didn't end well. We had a disagreement. Long distance was taking a toll on their relationship. She was a little emotional, saying, oh, you know, you don't love me, I'm not with you, and a little insecurity. They spoke around 10 p.m. Rob had no idea that it would be the last time he would ever hear her voice. That's just not something that even came in my mind. You unfortunately, take things for granted. The next morning was when Jennifer didn't show up for work and didn't answer her phone. She was always on the radar with everybody. It was so out of character for Jennifer to not respond, her friends and family rushed to her condo. We were probably on the road within five minutes. We were very frantic. Okay, call the hospitals again. Okay, call the police again. When they arrived at the condo in the early afternoon, a building manager opened Jennifer's locked apartment. What did you see the first time you walked in? her travel bag. It was like she walked in the night before and just dropped her suitcase right where it was. The rest of the home looked like a maid had been there. Except for Jennifer's bathroom. God love Jennifer, but she's a little bit of a bathroom pig in the morning. So makeup, curling iron, all that stuff all over the vanity, wet shower, wet towel. Back in 2008, the Kessies told 48 Hours that while the condo appeared to be in order, they did notice that Jennifer's purse, keys, and cell phone were missing. What do you believe happened? She slept, for sure, and I think she got up for work, as she normally would. Okay, I'm going to work, I have a meeting, it's busy. Locks the door of her condo. That's where the mystery starts. It's your sister, it's your family, it's your blood. I love her. That afternoon, Jennifer's brother, Logan, began to question some of the construction workers at the complex. He said they were uncooperative. It didn't feel right. Did you sense somebody knew something? Yeah, 100%. At first, the Kessies say police infuriated them by not taking their daughter's disappearance seriously. I'm like, come on, start to work, get to work. Police say they did not believe Jennifer's case met the criteria for declaring her missing. They kept suggesting that she must have had a fight with her boyfriend and would be back. Joyce used to complain to me. She's like, call them. I don't hear helicopters in the air. But by early evening, when there was still no sign of Jennifer, police officially declared her missing. 
And despite evidence that she was at her condo that morning, police pursued a theory that Jennifer may have been abducted the night before. Cell tower data was analyzed and it indicated Jennifer was out of her apartment and not at home. Police kept insisting that Jennifer went out in the middle of the night and we're like, you don't understand. That's not how our daughter's brain works. But upon further investigation, police realized the cell tower data was misinterpreted and she actually wasn't out that night. She was the type of person who would call her mom or her dad or me when she was simply walking from Target in the parking lot and it was dark out. We all along have felt that she was abducted in the morning. But police were very quick to shut us down on certain things. As the hours went by, the Kessies' panic became unbearable. They feared that time was running out. We have to find her as quickly as possible because the more time that passes, the less chance we have and the worse it's going to be. Using Jennifer's apartment as their headquarters, they began their own media blitz. You could go to any part of town and everyone knew Jennifer Kessie's name and they knew her face because there were posters, there were billboards. Her face was everywhere. The searches were massive. There were hundreds of people that came out. The community just rallied. I had never seen anything of this magnitude. But still, no one knew where Jennifer was. As you can imagine, we were basket cases. Oh, we were flipping out. Then, two days after her disappearance... I think that my heart stopped. Police found Jennifer's car. Panic. Sheer panic. The most frustrating thing is not knowing where Jennifer's at. Not knowing where to look next. Patrol 13, can you send me the call, please? We can sit around and discuss different ideas and different theories, but not having a concrete, solid avenue to go down to bring resolution to the family uh, is the most frustrating part of this case right now. As the desperate hours went by, Sergeant Roger Brennan and his team of investigators searched the streets of Orlando looking for Jennifer Kessie. We were going through canvases of areas that she would travel or that she might be at. 48 Hours interviewed him in 2008. As we were driving around the area, around her complex, we were trying to identify different areas that her vehicle may have been seen. Jennifer's car had been seen the morning she disappeared. A couple said they saw it swerving out of her apartment complex at around 7.40. It appeared that somebody was fighting over control of the car. Detective Joel Wright was one of the original investigators. Unfortunately, the witnesses couldn't say which way the car went once it got out onto the surface road. Then, two days after Jennifer vanished, Norris County Sheriff's Office received a call about Jennifer's vehicle being in the Huntington on the Green condominiums, approximately 1.1 miles away from her condominium. What was concerning about this was the area it was located is not an area frequented by Jennifer. It's actually a, a complex that's been known where stolen cars were, would be recovered from. You have that initial hope. You're like, OK, we found the car. It's only going to be a matter of time before we find Jennifer. In an unexpected move, detectives summoned boyfriend Rob Allen to meet them at Jennifer's car. When the police officer asked me to follow with him and to look at the inside of the car and the inside of the trunk, my stomach was churning as far as what could you find, you know? Despite being more than 200 miles away when Jennifer disappeared, Rob was suddenly a person of interest. I think they wanted to open the trunk in front of him to see his reaction if in case Jennifer was in there. When police opened the trunk, Jennifer wasn't there. 
there were no signs of a struggle. In fact, everywhere they looked, everything seemed normal. This is the interior of Jennifer's car as we found it. In 2008, Sergeant Brennan shared evidence photos. Several items were located inside the vehicle, her cell phone, charger, sandals, and shoes. Nothing appears to be disturbed in the vehicle at all. It didn't appear that it was a robbery. It didn't appear that it was a car theft. Uh, it didn't appear that uh, it was carjacking. When that car was found, we jumped all over it. We immediately started asking everybody walking around if they had seen anything. The canvassing started then, and then it got more intense as the days went on. And we eventually had horses and, and uh, helicopters and everything else up in the air looking around. We didn't come up with any solid leads of anybody who saw Jennifer, saw anybody park her vehicle here. But when police checked security cameras, it looked like they finally caught a big break. We have a film of the car being dropped off. Around noon on the day Jennifer disappeared, one of the cameras captured a person driving Jennifer's car. He pulls into a parking spot next to the pool area, backs out to even straighten himself in there, sits in there for 32 seconds, gets out, walks away, never looks back, The phantom figure walked away in the direction of Jennifer's complex. It was beyond frightening. In my mind, it was that person took my daughter. And how fast can we find that person? This is the camera that, that caught the person that parked Jennifer's vehicle here. But to the Kessie's frustration, the person caught on that camera could not be identified. Apparently this video, when it films, captures every two to three seconds as it's filming, so that's why you only see the subject on one side of the gate and then the opposite side of the gate, and he's blocked by the posts on either side of the gate. Technology then was not what technology is now. What are the chances of that happening? But it did. Seeing that tape of Jennifer's car, that was probably the worst moment. It was like being hit with a ton of bricks. And then also anger, just anger, because the, the person was so casual. Something really bad obviously happened, and they were just so casually dropping this car off like they were, you know, getting home from work. We printed up pictures, and we brought them out here. We were hopeful that somebody would recognize just the gait or just the general appearance or the stature or maybe the hairstyle or some aspect of this individual, but uh, that didn't happen. What does that image tell you of that individual in front of the gate? It's difficult to tell. It looks like a man by the wall, by the gate, uh, and someone with pretty big feet for his height is what we're, the information we've been getting. In 2008, Detective Wright and Sergeant Brennan analyzed the surveillance tape with 48 hours. What do you know about this person's height? We've done uh, quite a bit of measuring and work with the camera angles and also had people of different heights walk by. We've uh, come up with a height of between 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 5. And uh, this has been backed up by uh, the FBI who also came down and checked out the figures. Uh, the clothing looks to be maybe someone who is a painter or some type of worker. What do we know was going on around Jennifer's condominium at that time? We know there was quite a bit of a renovation going on inside her complex. The workers made her feel uncomfortable. She just said, you know, there's a lot of workers here and they tend to like just stop when I'm walking by or going to my car and they just look. Complicating the investigation, many of the workers disappeared before police could talk to them. Some of the people who were working on the property left. A lot of your day laborers are um, not here uh, legally. So I think they were scared. Investigators then went to check the security cameras at Jennifer's condo complex, but there weren't any. Just a security guard who is supposed to log the names and license numbers of visitors. However, the logs that we went through uh, didn't appear to be complete. 
they also couldn't count on getting any reliable forensic evidence from Jennifer's condo. It was never secured by Orlando police. By the time they took it seriously, we had 14 people in the condo. And they said, well, you ruined the crime scene. And I said, are you kidding me? They had no better luck with the forensics inside Jennifer's car. We didn't find any fingerprints on the steering wheel. Do you think the car was cleaned by someone? Possibly wiped it. The surveillance video does tell us that there was about 30 seconds of time when the person was inside the car. That person could have taken that time to wipe down the steering wheel and the rearview mirror or, or what have you. And what about DNA? There was some vacuuming samples taken from each section of the vehicle that were subsequently sent off to a lab for evaluation. But the samples were inconclusive. So to me, they don't have DNA. At every turn, the detectives kept coming up empty, and the case was going cold. But the Kessies refused to give up on Jennifer. I refuse to let her be forgotten until she's found. See more photos from the case on Facebook at 48 Hours. There's just no other place I could be today. So my heart is here. In 2008, on the second anniversary of Jennifer's disappearance, family and friends gathered on a street corner in Orlando. It's just difficult not having her. You know, she's like my other half, so. I just miss talking to her. They held up signs, just as they had done the day Jennifer went missing with the desperate hope that someone passing by knew something. A wrong has been done and a person has been taken against her will and that's, that's my daughter and she needs to come home to her family. Maybe the right person will see us. Detective Joel Wright was still trying to solve this confounding mystery. There were an unbelievable amount of man hours went into this case. In 2009, Detective Wright decided to take a fresh look at the case. One of the people he interviewed on audio tape was a former housekeeper at Jennifer's complex. The woman had not been questioned back in 2006. Do you remember uh, a uh, person by the name of Jennifer Kessie that uh, turned up missing? Yes, she remembers the case. When he showed her that security camera photo of the unidentified suspect, she gave him a possible new lead. She did look at the photo and said, that looks like Chino. The housekeeper said the phantom figure's walk, clothing, and hairstyle resembled a man she knew from the complex named Chino, but she could not be sure it was him. Chino was a name Detective Wright had not heard before, but he learned Chino used to live in another building at Jennifer's condo complex and was a former maintenance worker there. In fact, Chino had done work in Jennifer's condo just one week before she disappeared. And that's not all he learned. I put just the name Chino into a leads tracking system and one tip did come up, a crime line tip had been received in the first week of the investigation. The tip was anonymous and suggested Chino may have been involved in Jennifer's disappearance, but it's unclear if police had looked into it or talked to Chino at all. At that point, I thought the investigation was kicking into gear. It wasn't hard to find Chino. He was serving time in a Florida prison for statutory rape of a teenage girl a crime he committed two years after Jennifer disappeared. I knew that Chino uh, had been arrested for a sex crime, and that was part of the development of him as a person of interest. You go by Chino, is that right? Yes. Detective Wright interviewed him in prison and asked him about working in Jennifer's condo. When you did the work in her unit, was she present while you were doing it? Yes, she was. How did you get into the condo? She left. 
Is everything normal? Everything was normal. We got ready for work and done. Chino was then asked about these pictures, the one that the housekeeper said may have looked like him. You know, the photos that you looked at earlier, the guy walking by the gate, right? Is there any reason why somebody would, would say that was you? No, not really. And Chino is five foot nine, taller than the figure's height estimated by police. Chino is very cooperative. Uh, he was familiar with the case and he denied any kind of uh, wrongdoing. Chino agreed to take a lie detector test. He passed. And what did that tell you? It told me that he passed the polygraph, but I would never rule someone out just because they passed the polygraph. Wright also re-interviewed another maintenance worker who had done repairs with Chino in Jennifer's condo. Is nobody mad about anything and getting along fine? Everybody getting along fine. Regular conversation, just letting us know what she wanted to be done in her unit. Detective Wright then interviewed the building manager at Jennifer's condo to find out if there were any issues between Jennifer and Chino or anyone else. Are you aware of anybody that might have had a problem with Jennifer that worked there or lived there? No. Again, the case stalled. Then, in 2010, Detective Wright was moved off the case. As time went by, the Kessies felt abandoned by the Orlando Police Department. We asked them for several years to make her case cold because there's more resources available for cold cases. And they kept saying, nope, her case is extremely active. Do you believe that anyone realistically has been working this case in recent years? No. No. In 2016, it had been 10 years since Jennifer went missing. She was declared dead by the state of Florida. That was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I stood in a courtroom alone while a judge declared her deceased. Fed up, the Kessies made a dramatic move. They sued the Orlando Police Department to get Jennifer's case files. At the time, we thought, they want what? They want the police department's files? I had never heard of that happening. In 2018, Orlando Rolone became the Orlando police chief. Although he wasn't in charge during the initial investigation, he sympathizes with the Kessies. I can understand why they're frustrated. I can understand why they would feel that maybe an agency like ours has not delivered on what they would expect for an agency to do. Chief Rolone gave his investigators six months to work the case, and when they came up with no new leads, he made the unprecedented decision to finally release the files to the Kessies. After the number of years that we have spent uh, trying to solve Jennifer's disappearance, I think it was time to also honor the wishes of the family. The family wants closure. We want closure. We want to find the person responsible for her disappearance. I think it's a win-win for all. So these are just some of your daughter's case files? Yes, I mean, we probably have at least three times more in boxes of this. In all, the Orlando Police Department handed over more than 16,000 pages of documents and 67 hours of video and audio to the Kessies. But under the agreement, the Orlando PD would no longer lead the investigation. So at this point in time, the only people that are truly investigating what happened to Jennifer is us and our team. When you talk about challenging investigations, this is the one. Michael Toretta is the Kessie's private investigator. I'm looking through these 16,000 documents for something that might have been missed by the Orlando PD, the FDLE, maybe even the FBI, who have had parts in this investigation. He says when he reviewed the files, he was amazed at what police didn't do. There's never been one quarterback on this case. And who they didn't speak with. There's a lot of information that could have been developed that I believe wasn't in the most critical hours of this investigation.
We all have kids that this could have happened to. And as parents, we need to help out each other. And that's what I'm doing. Private investigator Michael Toretta says he has gone through the more than 16,000 page case file at least three times. He's hoping to find new clues as to who could have abducted Jennifer Kessie. I always told the Kessies what I like to do with this investigation is put a puzzle together, one piece at a time. One of the first things he did was go back to the scene of the crime and speak to people who lived at Jennifer's complex. You were there at the same time as Jennifer Kessie. Did you ever meet her? I don't recall formally meeting her. She did look familiar. Colleen, who asked to only use her first name, moved into the complex two years before Jennifer disappeared, believing it was a safe place to live. We were a gated community. We had a guardhouse. I would say 75% of the time, somebody was there. But she says once workers started living in empty apartments around the complex, she felt uneasy. When I would come home from work, there would be a large group of men outside drinking. And whenever I would have to walk past them, you know, there would be a little bit of comments or just a lot of uncomfortable stares. It, it wasn't a great feeling. I didn't like it. Colleen says she complained to the leasing office manager. He was apologetic, but he told me there was really nothing that he personally could do. From the very beginning, there were some uneasy things that I kind of brushed off that were red flags. When Tammy, who also asked to only use her first name, moved into the complex years later, she believed workers often entered her apartment when she wasn't home. There was creepy things like my underwear drawer was tossed. One time the shower was wet. There was footprints in my closet. And then Tammy says she caught a peeping Tom, a man she believes was a worker at the complex. He was pleasuring himself in the corner of my patio. You opened the door and saw that? Busted him, caught him. But she says he fled in a white van. Tammy filed a police report, and to this day, she says they have never found the peeping Tom or the white van he was driving. Then, Toretta spoke to a woman who did not want to appear on camera, and the name Chino came up again, that maintenance worker at Jennifer's complex. The woman claimed that Chino often approached her in the parking lot late at night when she returned from work and made her feel uncomfortable. How often would you socialize with him? A few times a week. But this woman, who wants to be called Ashley, had a different opinion of Chino. I remember him being fun and friendly, talkative. She moved into the complex just weeks after Jennifer disappeared. He came over to my condo quite a bit. She says they never talked about Jennifer's disappearance. I always wanted to ask him, you have keys to all the apartments. What do you think happened? That's a really hard question to ask somebody that's sitting on your couch next to you. Ashley says she never was suspicious of Chino until one day nine months after Jennifer vanished, when Chino suddenly disappeared and moved out of the complex in the middle of the night. He had the opportunity to tell me, and he didn't. Ashley says at first she didn't reach out to police. I sat on it for a little bit, and it just ate away at me. So I did. I called the crime line back then and told them, and they took my statement. But she says no one ever followed up with her. Why is what the women at the Mosaic told you important? I think it's important because it paints a picture that I don't believe I would have gotten from the 16,000 documents. There's nothing in there that indicates that there were problems at the Mosaic. After Chino's name came up multiple times, the Kessie team was anxious to talk to him. Chino should expect to hear from us. Chino needs to be spoken to again. And despite telling Detective Wright years ago he knew nothing about Jennifer's disappearance, the Kessies wondered if Chino was being truthful. Did he know more than he had admitted? The last time police officially questioned Chino was back in 2009. Now, we have some of our own questions we'd like to ask. So I'm heading now to his last known address 
where I'm hoping we can find it. Hey, how are you? Chino. I'm Peter Van Sant with CBS News. We agreed not to use his full name. When we asked about Jennifer Kessie, Chino quickly reiterated that he was innocent. I even did a lie detector test. I mean, everybody knows for a fact that I had nothing to do with Jennifer Kessie. You had nothing to do with her disappearance? Not at all. Where were you the morning of January 24th, 2006? I don't have to answer any questions, but that's for sure. And what about that photo taken by security cameras? Is this you? No, it's not. Do you know who this is? Uh, no, actually, I don't. You don't? I do not. Now, you were the maintenance man there. You mm -hmm. saw all the workers at that complex. No. You don't recognize this figure? No. Mi amor, it's OK. I have nothing to hide. OK. I do not recognize that person. Do you know of anyone who might have been involved in Jennifer Kessie's disappearance? Anyone? And believe me, if I did know anyone that was involved in that, the Kessie family would be known as well. I met Jennifer Kessie. She was a beautiful person. She had no problem with me. Before we left, Chino even agreed to talk with the Kessie team. And in fact, weeks later, he did. But there were no big headlines. Toretta presses on. I want to do my best and bring Jennifer Kessie home to them one day. After all the interviews and reviewing the case file, Toretta says he now has a new theory as to what could have happened to Jennifer Kessie. She's locking the door and never sees it coming. Fifteen years have passed since Jennifer Kessie vanished. Years of anguish for her family and friends. But they are determined to keep Jennifer's story alive. Jennifer is a super funny, super witty person. Very strong-willed and very assured of herself. She knew what track she was going to take and she knew how to get there. Jennifer is definitely the most loyal person I've ever been friends with or probably ever known. After years of working for the Kessies, private detective Michael Toretta says he has a new theory as to what he thinks could have happened to Jennifer. Based on interviews with people who lived at the complex, he believes that up to 10 construction workers were living in an empty apartment just across from Jennifer's. He thinks it was one or more of these workers who abducted her on January 24th, 2006. What I'm thinking is Jennifer comes out, she locks the door, of course she has her back to the apartment behind her, and then is abducted by those individuals across the way. Across the hallway? Yes. She's locking the door and never sees it coming. She probably was attacked immediately upon exiting. She's dragged into that other apartment, and that's the end. But Toretta struck out when he tried to find those workers who he believes lived in the vacant apartment across from Jennifer. And he says there is nothing in the files indicating that police ever spoke to them. It's impossible to find those individuals there's no lease. There's no list of names of who was staying in which apartment? Absolutely not. That was one of the most shocking parts of this investigation. As he continued his investigation, Toretta learned that 10 months after Jennifer disappeared, a person was seen dumping a rolled up piece of carpet into a lake not far from her condo. And what's intriguing based on your investigation is the men that were in the apartment across from Jennifer's were putting down carpet that day. That's why it's very interesting to me. Based on your experience, is there a possibility what this person threw in that pond was her body? Possibly. For the past two days, dive crews have been out on the water. In 2019, local police came out with a dive team. It was a good enough tip that you see the actions of 
I don't know how many divers. But no carpet was found. This is something that is haunting me. We need to see what's inside that carpet. The Kessies have dedicated their lives and weathered enormous financial hardship to finding the truth of what happened to their beautiful 24-year-old daughter on that January morning in 2006. It's very, very hard to move forward. The hole in our heart is forever there until we have an answer. We just want an answer. Jennifer's loved ones hope this report will convince someone to take the courageous step of coming forward with information that could solve this heartbreaking mystery. Because someone must have seen something. I just think of Jennifer all the time. Who knows what would have happened if this heinous crime hadn't been committed. For me, every milestone that I've had without her has been like a tug of war with my emotions. You know, getting married and having children and becoming a grown up and just living life, just having her life. You know, she deserved that. And we just wish that one person that knows something in Orlando would just finally say it. It's about Jennifer, it's not about us. And just please think of Jennifer. The Kessies are offering a $15,000 reward for information leading to Jennifer's whereabouts. If you have any information about Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, please visit the Find Jennifer Kessie Facebook page. A rising young music producer. I said, what's wrong, Kevin? I said, I feel like something's going to happen. 10 to 17 shots. How much do you have to kill him? Who killed Kevin Harris? The clues are absolutely out there. 48 Hours, Saturday at 10, 9 central on CBS.